Hello, uh, welcome to March 2023 of Paleo Rewind. Uh, I just want to say right off the bat, thank you so much, uh, Destin from Edge, uh, for inviting me onto this project. And I also want to give a special shout out to everyone who is also on Paleo Rewind this year. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for inspiring me and many others. If you're wondering who I am, my name is Will. I run the Prehistoric Connection YouTube channel. I am formerly known as ATR1X underscore or Atrix. Uh, I've collaborated with Destin before, uh, most notably on the Dreadnoughtus uh, video. I'm a uh, undergraduate student, uh, specifically doing paleontology, a uh, major in geology, minor in biology. I do microfossils, and most recently I've been doing stuff with uh, false gharial relatives from Maryland. And if you want to stay up to date with what I do, uh, feel free to uh, just come over to the channel, subscribe. Without further ado, March 2023 in paleontology in review. So, lips or no lips? That is the question that this paper uh, tackles with Cullen and other authors, uh, theropod dinosaur, facial reconstruction, and the importance of soft tissues in paleobiology. Uh, basically, the hypothesis that they are trying to tackle is beautifully illustrated in the first figure on this paper, uh, that is, which is the most likely condition in the theropod dinosaurs we know and love? Well, it's either the unlipped or lipped condition, again, figure one, done by Mark P. Witten, beautifully illustrates this. The unlipped condition is where we have uh, the teeth splayed out, overriding the uh, the denaries and profile view from the maxilla and the premax. Or do we have a condition where uh, those teeth are covered nicely, uh, sitting right next to the dentaries uh, if you look straight at the head. And they couldn't really test this with birds, so they decided to uh, go with uh, lepidosaurs, uh, namely uh, animals like Varanus, the monitor lizards, and Balorinicus, the Galapagos marine iguana. We also have like alligators, and they also even threw in an extinct early crocodilomorph, Hesperosuchus. And so uh, they also did some uh, histo, uh, histology on Desplodosaurus and the alligator. So they basically cut a alligator tooth and Desplodosaurus tooth, and they were basically looking at the structure. And so uh, all this data kind of turned into a linear uh, correlation graph where they found that the Tyrannosaurus and Gorgosaurus and Coelophysis, these theropods we don't know, they correlate strongly with Varanus. And so what they concluded was the most likely condition is lips, and uh, I am I'm sold on that. I've seen plenty of paleo art with lips, and I, I completely support that. Uh, however, I think that um, the sample size really needs to be expanded upon, uh, especially with the histology and... Uh, I really just hope more studies will come out in the future. In other news, uh, we have new fossils that push back uh, the origins of ichthyosaurs. Uh, this is a publication uh, done by Kier and other authors, uh, where they uncovered a, a centra, which is like the, uh, the circular base of a vertebra. And the centra is very big, it has a lot of spongy bone, and that's inside of it, and a lot of what they see is indicative of uh, adult ichthyosaurian bone microstructure, and that's verbatim from the paper, uh, which implies pelagic habitats, that is, open ocean uh, behavior, so more or less in that ecological area. On top of this, uh, that also includes stuff like accelerated growth, uh, and elevated metabolism. Ichthyopterygians, that is, ichthyosaurs and ancestors, uh, emerging a lot earlier than expected with these traits that are key to them becoming very successful. Uh, the most interesting part about this find is hands down the age. It is less than 2.3 million years after the end Permian mass extinction. Speaking of early appearances of uh, taxa, which are large bodied, we have a new species of Whittia, that is a genus of Coelocanth, described by Chase Brownstein of Yale University. And uh, this novel species, known as Whittia giganteus, 
uh, it comes from the late Triassic Dockham group of Texas. Two important implications I want to talk about here. Uh, firstly, the size. Based on the holotype skull, uh, which preserves the upper skull fairly well, uh, despite being very eroded, uh, more or less, along with the mandibles, uh, it's, it's clearly indicative of a large body size. And we don't typically see this uh, early on in coelocanths, making Whittia giganteus the most massive member of its genus and one of the largest known Triassic actinisteans, which that's the group which includes coelocanths and lobed fin fish. And secondly, the phylogenetic analysis shows that Whittia giganteus plus the other species of uh, Whittia, they share a node, that is, they share a split with the uh, extant lineages of coelocanth and other lineages of extinct coelocanth, uh, including things like uh, the Mossonid coelocanths, which uh, Mossonia is a part of, which this is an example of a coelocanth later on in the lineages, which, which they achieve large body size. We're going to uh, downsize a bit here, uh, entering Veronov and colleagues' study here ontogeny and miniaturization of Alvarasoridae. Uh, this is essentially a revision paper uh, where they look at the known holotypes and specimens of the Alvarasaurs. And this was a paper I unfortunately missed in my Alvarasaurs fuzzy oddballs video. Uh, but to kind of summarize here, uh, Alvarasaurs, based on other studies, have been demonstrated to not really follow Cope's rule per se. Cope's rule is a biological idea where over time in a certain lineage, uh, the more evolved they are, the, the more they progress, the larger they'll become as a lineage, that is, in body size. And Alvarasaurs are an exception to this because they are miniaturized. However, um, this is all instantly skewed if you factor in ontogeny. Ontogeny is the study of the growth of organisms, and simply put, if your holotype is a juvenile, this creates problems with your diagnostics of a new taxon. If your holotype is a juvenile, how are you supposed to identify the adults? And so this is really what the paper goes into. A uh, parvocursor, a genus of Alvarosaur, was found to be a juvenile less than a year old based on histological approaches. Not only is parvocursor uh, recovered as a juvenile regarding the holotype, Achillesaurus, Aorun, Alvarosaurus proper, these have juvenile holotypes. They'll turn problematic with time, of course, but other uh, holotypes of certain taxa based on fusions of certain forelimb elements, it demonstrates to paleontologists then that these are adult specimens, that these holotypes are good for defining certain individuals of certain uh, genera. So overall, it's a very important paper to have come out uh, really trying to pin down the miniaturization of uh, Alvarosaurs throughout time. We generally have accepted that the center of mass of dinosaurs is more concentrated around the sacral girdle, that is, the hips. However, in birds, uh, it's a lot more oriented towards the head, and the distribution is a lot more deep. This is something uh, clearly revealed in this paper published in Nature Communications by Macaulay and colleagues. Uh, they basically use these new volumetric techniques to take a look at the evolution of the center of mass uh, throughout time concerning dinosaurs and their ancestors. This not only applies to birds, but also the Pseudosuchians that is, alligators, uh, crocodiles, so on and so forth, and they even put in uh, squamates into the analysis. Uh, they found that in the uh, center of mass evolution in bird-line dinosaurs, the second figure of the paper, that yes, the outgroup of all these reptiles are up top. However, as we go down, we see some overlap, namely in ornithomimosaurs, microraptor, and modern-day ostriches, or hummingbirds, dromaeosaurids, and tyrannosaurids, and kingfishers, and pelicans occupying another morphospace. It's very, very interesting. It's a very interesting paper really trying to get at the origins of the modern-day avalian bow plan. They also found some very interesting data such as uh, Storicosaurus has one of the more caudal-based uh, 
center of mass distributions. And so that's something hitting at the ancestral condition of, well, dinosaurs, non avian dinosaurs. So, sauropods. They are the largest known terrestrial animals to date. Well, how did they get so big? Well, they had very light bones. They are pneumaticized. Uh, that's the word to describe them. They were hollowed out, and they took up a air sac system within life. And so, a lot of paleontologists have been thinking about where this invasive air sac system comes from, and that's what Orellano and colleagues sought out to do in this special issue article of the anatomical record titled The Origin of an Invasive Air Sac System in Sauropodomorph Dinosaurs, a uh, specimen of macro column from the late Triassic of southern Brazil, uh, and they analyzed it via microcomputed tomography. And they found that, well, it was pneumaticized. There were pneumatic fossa preserved. The air sac system was furthermore preserved. And this is actually incredibly significant because this is at the moment, and I quote, uh, the chronologically oldest and phylogenetically earliest unambiguous evidence of an invasive air sac system in a dinosaur. Which is big news. Burio lestis, something that is more basal than macrocolum, uh, did not have this. They say that it's possible that this air sac system, this invasive air sac system, was not uh, consistent in an evolutionary sense. Uh, however, over time, we do see throughout uh, these forms, the sauropodomorphs, they do eventually normalize it into their anatomy. The study of trace fossils, that is, ichnofossils, is very important when you have a notable lack of vertebrate body fossils, and even if you have vertebrate body fossils, they cannot always be informative of certain lifestyles. And so this is especially pronounced in this paper titled Unique Trackway on Permian Cruise Shoreline Provides Evidence of Temnospondyl Locomotory Behavior by Groenwald and colleagues. This is a Permian Age Paleosurface site uh, with the underlying formation being the Waterford Formation and the overlying formation being the Balfour Formation. And it's mainly indicative of a regressive deltaic environment. Uh, that is, it's a delta slowly becoming more influenced by uh, loads of water. And at the site are trace fossils. They've been noted before uh, in fieldwork efforts. However, uh, the, the authors, they were very interested in what uh, the trace fossils had to say. And they even uh, found a large unidentified bone that compares favorably with the dicynodont. But Enough of that, what do the trace fossils have to say? Well, we have these circular round depressions with minimal ripple marks that dominate the site, which is indicative of, uh, despite not being morphologically informative, indicative of a tetrapod track. Uh, this has mainly been attributed to dicynodonts. However, they took a, a much more keen interest in these linear carved out incisions that they have interpreted to be resting positions of uh, temnospondyls. They have also extrapolated from these trace marks that they swam with a sub-sinuous uh, uh, kind of manner. So it's similar to sharks and how other fishes do it. It's a very interesting paper. I highly recommend you go read up on it. So before I go in depth on the final paper of Paleo Rewind's March 2023 block, uh, I have five papers I briefly want to give an honorable mention to. First, we have a new specimen of Sinosaurus Triassicus from the early Jurassic of Lufang, China by Zhang and colleagues. Sinosaurus is important as a taxon as it is a early large-bodied neotheropod, and uh, like Dilophosaurus, uh, Sinosaurus has this unique double-crested morphology. Uh, and this is why uh, early on into its research, Sinosaurus was just diagnosed as an Asian species of Dilophosaurus. We know now this is not the case, and this was quickly uh, pointed out. Sinosaurus, furthermore, doesn't really have a ton of uh, remains associated with it, but uh, this, this skull it's beautiful. Uh, it is a beautifully complete skull uh, that uh, has also made the authors here propose three new uh, autapomorphies. We also have a, uh, a new pterosaur paper, distinctive as darkoid pterosaur jaws from the mid-Cretaceous Cambridge green sand of Eastern England and the Chem Chem group of Morocco. Uh, this uh, member of the late Cretaceous of 
uh, England is Sanomanian in age, uh, so the very first stage of the late Cretaceous is looked at here. And these uh, specimens uh, were originally identified as shark fin spines. Uh, however, uh, the unique formina and morphology has led these uh, researchers to reclassify these very fragmentary remains as uh, edentulous jaws, uh, which is indicative of an astarcoid pterosaur, as uh, practically all taxa in astarcoidia are. Uh, are edentulous, they don't have teeth. They also furthermore differ from the already named as darkoid ornithostoma known from uh, the Cambridge greensand. Uh, based on the lateral surfaces, they're flat, which differs from the condition in ornithostoma, and they also have a uh, an acute dorsal ventral apex, uh, that is the end of the, uh, the jaw has a different morphology concerning the curvature. They are very similar to these other uh, pterosaur jaws from the Chem Chem of Morocco. Uh, this is uh, especially notable as there's a lot of pterosaur diversity there. It's indicative of similarity in faunal assemblages, at least concerning the pterosaurs, between two distant locations, which is very, very interesting. And also we have here a new uh, paleoanthropology paper, Knuckle Walking Sahanthropus, Locomotory Inferences from the Ulnae of Fossil Hominids and Other Hominoids. This is a paper challenging the notion that the famous Tumai uh, specimen, that is a skull uncovered from uh, Chad, the country of Chad in Africa, it may not be uh, upright. And uh, this paper suggests that Sahanthropus has a ancestral knuckle-walking uh, condition rather than the upright condition. So this uh, challenges the notion of the course of uh, evolution of us walking upright. So the final uh, study I want to go over here is titled The Stability and Collapse of Marine Ecosystems During the Permian-Triassic Mass Extinction. This is uh, a big paper. It could potentially change how we view the worst mass extinction to ever grace planet Earth, that being the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. And uh, essentially what they revealed was through quantitative approaches that uh, the ecosystem did not immediately just decline. Essentially what happened was there was a pre-extinction phase where we have a lot of diversity, but then that transitions to a big drop in biodiversity. However, the ecosystem was still relatively intact and it wasn't until later, briefly later, uh, this is, we're talking about like a gap of 61,000 years, where afterwards we have a massive collapse in biodiversity. And this is something that can really change how we view this pivotal uh, extinction event in Earth's history. It implies that uh, the collapse in biodiversity uh, predates more or less a ecosystem collapse, uh, which is very, very interesting. And they do a lot of different analyses to demonstrate this. So that's it for me concerning uh, March 2023. I feel like I covered a lot of interesting stuff. I hope you guys really enjoyed. Uh, again, be sure to subscribe and follow what I do if you're interested at all. And uh, I just hope for the best. Thank you so much to Destin from Edge for having me take up this opportunity. And uh, yeah, have a great uh, new year.